Good morning, everyone. This is Brian Barnsdale with Car Rigs and Ingram. I'm pleased to welcome you this morning to our uh, webinar on the importance of not-for-profit board training. Uh, when we're as we're getting started, I'd like to mention just a, a couple of uh, administrative type notes for you. Uh, one, uh, you might be asking whether we provide CPE credits for today's webinar, and the answer to that question is no, we do not. Uh, we have not tried to go through the process of registering our webinar content through each state board of accountancy uh, that might be on here. Uh, so this content is being provided for your information only, not really for CPE. Uh, our list of attendees really spans uh, the southeast and beyond, so uh, we do cover uh, a lot of states uh, within our footprint, and we've got some participants on the webinar today that are that are outside that footprint as well. Um, secondly, uh, often our webinar attendees will ask about the availability of a recording of the webinar after it's finished. Um, the answer is yes. Uh, we will be sending a link to that recording to all of our registered attendees a little bit later today. We do not distribute the actual si slides, but you will uh, have access to a link for the recording. Also, just to note that uh, all attendees are, are muted in terms of the telephone the audio controls, but you can enter any questions that you might have in the questions pane, so feel free to do that uh, as we move along, and we'll try to get to those as we can. Just uh, a little information about your presenters today. Uh, for myself, again, uh, my name is Brian Barksdale. Uh, You'll notice uh, my primary hobby, the only one listed there, is motorcycle road racing, which is road course type racing. It speeds up to around 175 or 180 miles an hour. So that's uh, I only do that to break free from that stereotypical image of being a boring CPA. So at least on some weekends, I'm not quite as boring as usual. Um, also, just a, a note, I, I've been in the same firm for really for 38 straight years, uh, which I understand is a bit unusual these days. A lot of people. Uh, I think it's uh, extremely unusual and that I'm a little crazy, but I guess I don't do change very well. Uh, but over the course of the years, uh, I've developed a specialty in the governmental and nonprofit entity work, uh, audit accounting and tax work. So that's really my frame of reference for working with nonprofit management and boards. So I think that might be helpful to know uh, as we begin our presentation today. My co-presenter today is Matt Gunning. Uh, go ahead, Matt, and give a little little background about yourself as we get started. Thank you, Brian. Um, yeah, Brian mentioned I'm Matt Gunning. I'm in our Atlanta office, kind of the primary not-for-profit uh, partner here in Atlanta. Um, one of those relevant experience items, too, is I've also had, as probably many of you have, uh, a good bit of experience serving on boards. And I think over the years we've found that maybe some organizations do things better than others, as you would might imagine, and we kind of tried to pick some things from the best practices, and we're going to compile them here, and hopefully we'll get something out of this today. Um, most of my time spent with uh, my daughters. It says Grace is 14. She actually just turned 15. Got her learner's permit, so that's kind of frightening. Um, but we do a lot of uh, travel with them, and also uh, they play volleyball, so spend a lot of time on the road with that. Um, and with that, we'll go ahead and get started. I'll throw it back to Brian and rejoin you later uh, when we get into some of the other content. Okay, great. Thanks, Matt. First, as we get started, let me just give a, a brief uh, overview of, our, of today's presentation so you can kind of know what to expect. Uh, first, we'll have an overview of our nonprofit board members' duties and responsibilities, of which there are many. Uh, but we'll look at that overview of what they should be doing. Uh, we'll also take a look at three critical areas of board responsibility. Those are governance, finances, and compliance. We'll conclude today with a summary of the kind of the big picture of board training and what needs to take place and the kind of expectations that you should have for board training type uh, uh, tra seminars and meetings. So first, as we get started, let's, let's give a little salute to our board members. Uh, if you're in executive leadership at really any nonprofit, you should probably stop for just a minute and thank your board. Yes, I think we all understand that boards can be pretty challenging. Um, there are always a few interesting personalities to deal with, uh, and you may not always see eye to eye. But the reality is that we, you really do need a well-trained and fully engaged board in order to do your job well. Nonprofit boards set the tone, they provide direction, and ultimately, they help shape the success of a nonprofit organization. So they're critical to the success of everything that goes on. 
During our time together, we'll be taking a look at the critical role that your board plays in the overall success of your organization, as well as some of the problems that can occur when board members don't have the training that they need to reach their full potential. We'll be asking a few poll questions along the way just to gauge how prepared your current board is to fulfill their fundamental roles, and we'll give the results of those as we move through the, the poll questions. So let's take a look uh, at what an effective, efficient, and fully engaged board should be doing, and then we'll compare that to where you think your board is. Be all you can be was the recruiting slogan of the U.S. Army for more than 20 years. This idea of giving our recruits the training, the direction, and the tools that they need to reach their full potential certainly has a lot of merit for nonprofits. Just like Buck Privates reporting for basic training, board members come from many different places, whether they may be homemakers, business owners, professionals, or retirees, they've all been recruited because they're passionate about the cause and the mission of the nonprofit, and they come ready to serve the organization. Yet, in many cases, they may be unprepared for duty. Likewise, even battle-hardened veterans need some regular training. Long-serving board members can be blindsided if they're not up to date on regulatory changes, compliance issues, and best practices for nonprofit organizations. Ultimately, nonprofit leaders should serve as the field marshal. They should equip their board members to work together as a team and fulfill their collective poten potential to promote the organization's vision, mission, and values. Whether you're a startup social services agency, a well-established arts organization that's been around for many, many years, or maybe a large community health organization, the fundamental roles and responsibilities of each one of these are the same. Boards guide, executive directors execute. But not every board member has the proper training or really the experience to succeed in that role. Some don't really understand the role. And that's kind of a shame because if they don't really understand their place in the big picture, they really can't live up to their full potential as board members. So what exactly are board members tasked with doing? Really probably three basic roles that we've got here outlined. First and foremost, their task would be in the vision keepers. They should have a clear understanding of the organization's vision and purpose and a vision for where it's headed next. Secondly, they're responsible for the money. They should know where the revenue comes from, where it's going, and what steps are being taken on a daily basis to protect the organization's assets. Third, and perhaps most importantly, board members are the ones who should be asking the really tough questions. They should be exercising independent thinking, and providing critical checks and balances to the executive leadership of the nonprofit. Unfortunately, without the proper training and orientation, board members don't always live up to these roles. Bad things can start happening when board members are asked to serve without adequate training. All right, here's the scary part. An untrained board can honestly be a dangerous board. There's really not any other good way to say it. It's kind of like sending soldiers into battle without sending them through boot camp first. Bad things can happen if they're not prepared to do their duty. I've got some examples here, uh, five of them. One is that uh, they can overstep their authority. They may be well-meaning board members, but they can start meddling in the organization's day-to-day -day operations when, in fact, their primary duty is to set policy and to provide high-level leadership. They may not follow the rules. An untrained board faces a minefield of unfamiliar rules, regulations, and compliance requirements. For example, a very poorly trained compensation committee might trigger some really harsh penalties if the executive director's pay isn't supportable under the intermediate sanction rules. Thirdly, they don't understand the financials. Board members are required by law to protect their organization's fiscal health. Yet, nonprofit financial statements can really be a pretty hard read, even for otherwise financially savvy professionals. If they can't follow the numbers, board members really can't make effective financial decisions for their organization. Fourth, they may not follow proper procedures. Something really as basic as maintaining accurate minutes and properly documenting decisions can be a challenge for an untrained board. And finally, they can create conflicts of interest. 
without training, board members may not really understand the serious nature of related party transactions and conflicts of interest. Not knowing any better, a board member might urge the organization to purchase insurance company coverage through a firm that's controlled by his spouse, for example. So the question becomes, do you have any loose cannons on your board? It's time for our first poll question. So we'd like to ask just the, the overall question, how well does your board understand and live up to its role in your organization? Very much, somewhat, not so much, or not at all. If you'll take just a minute and vote on these questions here so we can kind of get a feel for our audience. We'll take a look at it and see. As we're looking at that, I'll just mention, uh, I said earlier that we've got a pretty broad span of uh, participants throughout the, the Southeast and beyond. Uh, we've also got a pretty good selection of representatives from a variety of nonprofit types like health services, trade associations, uh, some children's organizations, as well as uh, some music and arts uh, organizations. So it is a pretty good, uh, pretty good range that we have today. I think we're probably pretty close to through with that. Let's going to see how we what our numbers look like. You'll see very much. We have 31%, so that's great uh, that we have uh, some that really do live up to that. Somewhat's 54%, which is about what we honestly see a lot of the time. People are sort of in that middle ground. Not so much or not at all that together adds up to 16%. So uh, those are certainly ones that we would be you know, interested in being sure that they uh, are able to, to improve and learn more. So as we move ahead, we know that your the, the first poll question is pretty important because nonprofits are really under the microscope these days. There's really a lot of prying eyes out there, and much of what a nonprofit does is public information, as we all know. Some examples of people that watch nonprofits are the IRS. The message from the IRS has been pretty loud and clear. Sound governance matters. The IRS Form 990 that was revised a few years ago uh, asked some very pointed questions about your organization's board structure, your policies, and your practices that have to be answered. State regulators are important as well. Attorneys general in approximately 45 states strictly regulate nonprofit fundraising, and they back up their bark with plenty of bite. There are charity watchdog groups out there, groups such as Charity Watch that we all are familiar with, GuideStar, uh, Charity Navigator. Uh, they all rank nonprofits using the data that's on that IRS Form 990, and they post it on the Internet for the world to see. The media is always out there taking a look at what's going on. The nonprofit sector is a very huge, multi-billion dollar industry. There are stories to be found, both good and bad, and media coverage of nonprofits has really increased dramatically over the last several years. Scandals in nonprofits are in the news on practically a daily basis. The public certainly is interested and watches closely what happens. Increasingly, we know that donors are asking questions about governance and finances before they make a decision to support an organization. So it's really more critical than ever to demonstrate that your board is following sound governance practices. So ask yourself, does your board convey competence and good governance? Really a lot of it comes down to this term, uh, fiduciary. We've talked a lot about the dangers of an untrained board in a fairly general sense, but let's look at some of the specific duties and responsibilities that board members need to understand. At the core are legal obligations as a fiduciary. Fiduciary, as you see the definition, is a, a trustee or a person to whom property or power is entrusted for the benefit of another. So basically, it means dealing with things that do not belong to them. The idea that they're a fiduciary is often a very unfamiliar concept for a lot of board members. I think this is especially true for business people who are used to making decisions that result in something for their own benefit rather than for others. Hopefully, during your new member board, board member orientation, you've kind of covered this. But let's take a look at the three major fiduciary duties. Fiduciary duties are really pretty serious business. As fiduciaries, board members are legally obligated to act in the best interest of their organization at all times. 
there's really three specific duties that have been outlined over the years that are common to fiduciaries. First is the duty of care. Board members should exercise prudent care when they make decisions for the organization. For example, they must read, evaluate, and ensure the accuracy of all the reports, including minutes, financial reports, and evaluations. They must fully participate in board meetings, deliberations, and all decisions. They also have a duty of loyalty. Board members are required to keep the best interest of the organization in mind at all times when they're making their decisions. For example, they really need to be careful to avoid any actual or perceived conflicts of interest. Lastly, they have a duty of obedience. Board members should be consistent. Their actions should be consistent with the organization's mission statement, the Articles of Incorporation, the bylaws, and tax exemption documentation. So that brings us to our second poll question. Which of these fiduciary duties that we just mentioned would you say that your board members fully understand and embrace and you can select all that apply? Duty of care, duty of loyalty, duty of obedience, or none of the above? A premature answer that. <laughs> All right, it's back open again. It's back open again. There we go. Now we go. Uh, you know, one issue I think that comes up fairly frequently on nonprofit boards is that many board members are also in private business, and unless it violates a law, for the most part, business owners can opt to follow or not follow the best practices and a lot of other things. That's especially true with only one owner. So when they're in a nonprofit organization, they have to have to really sort of shift gears and remember that it is a very different world when you're dealing with someone else's money. Okay. All right. How do we look on the totals on that, Matt? Okay. Duty of care ranks by far the highest. Uh, loyalty is down a bit and obedience is down and none of the above is also a pretty strong player at 17 percent so um, we do think that board members exercise prudent care in making decisions but they do need to remember these the loyalty and obedience and adhering to the requirements of the nonprofit organization so that's important all right next let me hand it back off to Matt I'll let you pick up and carry on from here all right thank you Brian um, so on these three critical areas of responsibility, uh, again, the, one of the key concepts is that board members guide, they don't manage. At the most fundamental level, board members' job is to set policy and provide high-level leadership, not to get involved with the day-to-day -day management of the, of the organization. That being said, board members do have some critical responsibilities. First of all, governance. They're responsible for governing the organization. And that means providing vision, strategic planning, and leadership. It means establishing appropriate policies and procedures, as well as providing oversight of the organization and its leaders. They have a financial responsibility. Board members have major responsibilities over the finances of the, of the organization. They're responsible for ensuring that funds are properly accounted for and for establishing financial controls to prevent fraud and ensure accurate financial reporting. And compliance. Finally, they're responsible for keeping the organization in full compliance with federal, state, and local laws and regulations. Let's take a closer look at the first of those responsibilities, providing sound governance. Public responds positively to not-for-profits that are transparent in reporting their financials and their fundraising practices. They like to see that not-for-profits have policies in place to avoid conflicts of interest and protect against fraud. And when the public sees that a not-for-profit has earned their trust, they overwhelmingly reward it with their support. Your board members set the tone. Nonprofit board members play a key role in casting the vision for the future and making sure that the organization lives up to that vision. They develop the vision and engage in strategic planning. Nonprofits that plan on being around for a while establish a long-range planning committee that meets regularly and they engage in board retreats. They utilize surveys, data, and analysis to identify new re revenue streams and potential new lines of business. They communicate the vision, mission, and values throughout the organization. In words and deed, 
board members bring these things to life, and they model them for staff, volunteers, donors, and constituents. They determine who will carry out the mission, and they accomplish this by selecting officers, staff, defining duties, and provide for follow-up and accountability. And they ensure that the organization's activities align with its mission and vision. In particular, they ensure that the day-to-day -day operations comply with the organization's governing documents, articles of incorporation, bylaws, and maybe even vision, mission, and value statements. And in order to do this, they need to understand these documents, review them on a regular basis, and update them as needed. They also guard against organizational drift and mission shift. For example, if an influ influential donor starts pushing for a homeless shelter to begin offering gambling addiction services, the board would work to keep the organization on track and make sure that was in line with their uh, organizational mission. And so ask yourself again, are you fully, fully utilizing the passion, energy, and tal talents of your board to cast a compelling vision for your organization? The best boards follow best practices. And the IRS considered it the best practice of governance to have some basic policies in place. In fact, you will be asked very specifically on your Form 990 whether you have these policies in place. It's important to note that the IRS lacks formal authority to require you to have those uh, policies in place, but IRS officials have indicated that not-for-profits that fail to adopt certain policies have a greater chance of being audited or, or put under scrutiny. First of all, conflict of interest policy. Has your board established procedures for identifying, disclosing, and dealing with situations where officers, directors, or trustees and key employees might have a conflict of interest? Whistleblower policy. Have you created a means for people to come forward to report suspected breaches in ethics and illegal or inappropriate activity without fear of retaliation? It's an interesting fact that this is the most common way that fraud is uncovered, and we've seen that several times um, over the years with clients. Um, document retention and destruction policy. Does your board have guidance on how long records must be kept before they're destroyed? Compensation. Is there a clearly articulated process for ensuring that the board has approved reasonable and not excessive compensation for the executive and CEO? And that includes uh, side benefits such as a, a car or housing and those kinds of things beyond the normal base salaries. And some additional governance policies and practices that can help ensure efficient day-to-day -day operations might include a gift acceptance policy, an investment policy, a code of conduct or employee handbook, and a travel and entertainment expense policy. And that'll bring us to poll question three. And I'll try not to close this one early this time. Which of these policies has your board adopted? And you can select all that apply. Uh, conflict of interest, compensation, document retention, whistleblower, and none of the above. Uh, we'll go over those in just a few minutes. Um, Whistleblower is one we've seen over the years that's come into play uh, and really stopped uh, fraud or at least curtailed it much earlier than probably would have been done otherwise. And conflict of interest is also another one that's important. Um, you see that a lot uh, where people, with, uh, for organizations will adopt a policy there but never really revisit it. And it's like any other thing, it's only as good as the time and attention you devote to it and follow up on it. I'm going to close that out, and we'll just look at our answers here. It looks like most of you have that conflict of interest policy. I'd encourage you to make sure that you follow up on that regularly. Um, the compensation policy, that's another very good one to have in place. Uh, that's where a lot of scrutiny from the IRS and outside uh, watchdog groups will come into play. 36% with a whistleblower and 45% with the document retention. Those are both good. If you have none of the above, you might want to consider looking into this a little closer and, and try to adopt some of these as you go. All right. There's, there's our results. We'll hide that and go forward. Okay, program services. Boards, they monitor and strengthen program services. And the board should regularly review program effectiveness and efficiency. 
and take appropriate follow-up action as necessary. They should gauge the cost of true the true cost of programs and need to understand the true operational cost of your programs and services, taking into account both direct and indirect costs. Sometimes those indirect costs can mount up more than you think they would. They need to measure the impact and effectiveness of the programs. They should carefully review outcomes, create appropriate metrics, and benchmark performance against other not-for-profits. They should make changes when appropriate. They should monitor performance, and when things are out of line, they should ask why. So another question, are your board members actively engaged in evaluating your organization's programs and services? Transparency and accountability start with your board. Board members have a role in ensuring that the not-for-profit is transparent and accountable. Effective not-for-profit boards are candid. They understand that a number of stakeholders are watching and expect full and open disclosure. They communicate effectively and openly with not-for-profit staff and stakeholders. And public inspection laws, well-trained board members understand the importance of making organizations' legal do documents easily accessible to the public upon request. And the IRS Form 990, knowledgeable board members understand that the Form 990 is a very public document. They know the internet has made it easier for donors, the media, and regulatory agencies to check up on your not-for-profit. And so they make sure that the organization's annual filing tells a compelling story that clearly illustrates wise stewardship. Is your board presenting your organization in the best possible light? Now we'll get into everybody's favorite topic, finances. A key topic, it's not their money, but they should treat it like it is. Let's go on to that next area. And one of those challenges for many board members, the organization's finances. And the big picture is, as we mentioned, it's not their money, but they do have to treat it like it is. Board members must understand and be fully engaged in their organization's finances and accounting so that they can make informed financial decisions that help meet its mission and sustain the organization over the long term. And not-for-profit accounting is where the going gets tough sometimes. The reality is you may not have recruited some very, you may have recruited some very sharp folks to serve on your board and they might have strong business backgrounds. But the bottom line is that accounting is different for not-for-profit organizations than it is for for-profit business. Board members with a for-profit background may struggle to grasp some of those differences. So let's look at where the disconnect occurs, and the eyes start to glaze over when the finances are being discussed at a board meeting. First of all, funds are subject to restrictions, and this, this is the single biggest difference between for-profits and not-for-profits, is that a binding restrictions can be placed on funds by the donor and currently be classified either as permanently or temporarily restricted or unrestricted. And restricted money isn't necessarily spent as it is released from restrictions. These restrictions appear on a not-for-profit's income statement and balance sheet, also known as the statement of activities and statement of financial position. And they show assets under three categories instead of being spent in the traditional sense. Funds are released from one category and transferred into another. And I'll add a side note, uh, in beginning in 2018, that'll be reduced to three because it will only be either restricted or unrestricted versus permanently and temporarily restricted. Um, promises to give are treated as an asset. Another difference, pledges are unique to the not-for-profit world. And these promises to give are treated as an asset and show on the books of, of the organization. They too are treated differently based on the con conditions set upon them. Unconditional promises to give is recorded as an asset when the promise is made. Conditional promise is recorded as an asset only if there is a remote possibility that the donor conditions will not be met. And a mere statement of intention to give is not recorded as an asset. Expenses are reported by their function, and that's another important distinction to make. Uh, most not-for-profit expenses report their expenses by expense classifications for program, management in general, fundraising, and other. It can be very confusing stuff if someone has not been brought up to speed on not-for-profit accounting. So, that will bring us to poll question four. How well do all of your board members, not just the CPA you have serving on the board, understand not-for-profit accounting? And we'll get 
that launched. See what we get back there. Um, I've mentioned on, as a side note that some of this is changing. The, the uh, major not-for-profit accounting rules have not really changed much in the past 20 years or so, uh, but beginning in calendar year 18, the requirements will change quite a bit, and we'll actually be doing some uh, webinars or uh, presentations on that as we go forward to our not-for-profit audiences about what all those changes mean as well. And so let's close that poll, and I'll share it this time. And it looks like we have about 69% of you that your non-CPA board members uh, are not so much in understanding the, uh, the counting rules. And so that's important, and as I mentioned, since those will be changing, might, might be a good time going forward to get your board members trained up on some of those new changes and, and the differences overall uh, with not-for-profit and for-profit accounting. I that. Move on here. Okay, financial reporting. Do your board members know what the financials represent? Like for-profit businesses, not-for-profits utilize GAAP, generally accepted accounting principles, Yet their financials are decidedly different, and that can be a challenge for board members who come from the for-profit world. If they can't read the financial statements, how can they possibly make informed financial decisions on behalf of the organization? One of those reports is a statement of financial position. And a statement of financial position for a not-for-profit, as we mentioned, is somewhat similar to a balance sheet for a for-profit business. And then it shows assets, liabilities, and net assets. Yet unlike with a for-profit, statement. The non-profit non statement shows net assets divided into those three categories, permanent, temporary, and unrestricted. And a statement of activities. This is similar to the income statement, as we mentioned, in the for-profit world. It shows revenues and expenses, and again in the three columns of restrictions. And this statement reflects funds being released from restriction in one place and being used in the other. A statement of functional expenses. It's an additional financial statement that is required for voluntary health and welfare organizations, although other not-for-profits often choose to include it with their annual reports. And here the non-profit provides detailed pres presentation of how expenses are charged or allocated between functions and programs. And again, that new, uh, those new pronouncements coming out are likely going to have uh, almost all not-for-profits presenting that statement of functional expenses as well. So a question. Think about it. Is your board financially literate when it comes to the organization's financial statements? Internal controls, another important financial concept. Do they understand the need for strong internal controls? This brings us to our next area of responsibility, ensuring strong financial controls are in place. Many board members understand the importance of segregation of duties or other controls to protect against fraud. But solid internal controls also play a strong role in relating to operations, reporting, and compliance. In reporting, strong financial controls help ensure the accuracy, reliability of accounting data, as well as the financial statements that are produced from that data. In operations, financial controls provide a process by which transactions are handled and encourage adherence to prescribed managerial policies. In compliance, Regulatory agencies, lenders, investors, and others want to know that the organization has instituted internal controls over financial reporting and that the numbers are accurate. Organizational integrity and public perception. Faith in financial statements and belief that the board is properly safeguarding the organization's assets has a direct impact on enrollment, revenue, and funding. So we'll get another poll question here. Which of these internal controls are in place at your organization? And you can select all that apply. We have segregation of duties, IT controls, meaning access and strong passwords, bank statements sent directly to the executive director or treasurer, uh, and then an audit committee. Uh, IT controls in particular are obviously something that's inherent in really every business there is. And uh, it's something that you want to make sure you've at least dress, addressed uh, on an access basis so that the appropriate people have access to your financial records as well as your donor lists, your member lists, and
and anything that has sensitive information there. So those there's some basic uh, controls in that area, and we can help you with those uh, as you institute some of them as well. So we'll give that one more second, and go ahead and close that out. Share it. It looks like about 75% of you have the segregation of duties in place. That's kind of internal control 101, so that's good to see. It's really good to see that you have 70% have those IT controls in place. That's really, really good results there. Also on the bank statement. And 42% have an audit committee. Sometimes that's uh, de facto given to the treasurer and the finance committee. Um, but the larger your organization gets, you may want to look at providing that committee or establishing one in place to oversee the audit process. Okay, let's move on. Speaking of the audit process, everyone's other favorite topic, the audit. Does your board understand the role in the auditing process? The board itself, through an audit committee if there's one in place, is responsible for providing independent review and oversight of the entire audit process. This includes engaging the independent auditors and bidding out the work at regular intervals or requesting a change in partner, overseeing the account if the committee chooses to remain with the same accounting firm. And the audit committee or board of directors also aid in audit planning, communicating with the auditors throughout the process. Reviewing the audit. Finally, the audit committee should consider meeting an executive session without the presence of management to discuss audit findings before reporting results to the full board of directors. The board should then review the audit report and address any control deficiencies that are found. So another question, are your board members actively engaged in the audit process? Another topic, compliance. And there are plenty of ways to get in trouble here, as we all might know. And this is the final area we're going to look at. Here, the final responsibility for all legal and compliance matters rests with your board. And some potential problem areas in that compliance arena. Does your board play by the rules? The regulatory landscape is constantly shifting. New legislation seems to always be on the horizon. This makes ongoing training and regular updates on compliance issues incredibly important. So some potential problem areas. Political involvement. Nonprofits can advocate for causes, but they cannot campaign for particular candidates or specific legislation unless they were specifically set up to do so. And if they do, they can face sanctions if they step over that line. Executive compensation. Executive compensation paid to directors and key employees can be grounds for the IRS to revoke an organization's tax-exempt status. And the IRS has assessed millions of dollars in penalties under the private endearment rule for these types of violations. Board members need to know how to make informed compensation decisions that pass IRS muster. Related party transactions. Board members need to understand the danger of related party transactions, which occur when someone conducts business with your organization in such a way as to gain some personal benefit. Maybe it's a major donor who promises future gifts only if the organization conducts business with a particular company. And ultimately, like family, mixing business with a charity can be a dangerous combination. Charitable solicitation. It's very easy to run afoul of registration requirements that many states, counties, and municipalities require in order for charities to solicit funds in their territories. And organizations that fail to register can be subject to fines and civil suits and even have the right to solicit contributions revoked. And the consequences for noncompliance can be dire. Board action and inaction, sometimes, can trigger often severe consequences. One is intermediate sanctions. Un unwary organizations find themselves caught up in the web of intermediate sanctions, which are special punitive taxes imposed on transactions involving ex excessive com compensation. Excise taxes. Organizations and disqualified persons can be subject to excise taxes related to the excess benefit transactions. Personal liability. A director or officer can be held personally liable if he or she fails to ensure that the not-for-profit deposits taxes, such as payroll and property taxes, or files necessary tax returns. And then loss of exempt status. In cases of continued or egregious violations, like failing to satisfy filing requirements, violating lobbying restrictions, 
substantial unrelated business income. The IRS may even revoke a not-for-profit's tax exemption status. So we'll go to our poll question number six. Does your board actions or inner inactions expose your organization to liability? We'll get that launched. Uh, those uh, one of that key concept, and Brian mentioned it earlier, of fiduciary duty. Uh, it's where a lot of these responsibilities fall into place, and board members should know that they can be legally responsible for uh, any inaction or appropriate inaction or action that their organization makes. So we'll give that one more second. Close it out. So it looks like 50% of you uh, say no, so that's good. I'd be concerned for the 33% that say yes, that you may have some potential liability there. There may be some regrouping you need to do with policies and procedures and make sure your board members understand their responsibilities there. So I'm going to throw it back here at the end uh, to Brian to get us the big picture for your not-for-profit and hopefully uh, summarize some of the things we mentioned today. Great. Thank you, Matt. Um, first, as we proceed here, if you've got any questions, feel free to type those in. We'll try to answer those at the end if we have any time. Uh, but uh, we want to go ahead and try to begin to wind some things up. So as we do wind it up today, I'd really kind of like to take a minute and bring us back to our big picture. And that is quite simply that our nonprofit leaders are really only as good as their boards. The executive's job, and many of you on the call today on the webinar are chief executives of organizations, your job is to manage the board's vision into a, a really concrete reality. If the board is trained in what they should do, and they've directed as they should, and the executive is managed effectively, then the organization should really perform well. But if nonprofit leaders are often only as good as their board, your board is only as good as their training. First, you need solid orientation. Helping board members to live up to their full potential starts with a solid orientation that helps to set expectations and to prepare new board members for their role. The best time is shortly after new board members have been elected each year. You can conduct orientation either before a regular board meeting, maybe during a retreat. And the real point I'd like to make is that new and existing board members should both attend. Topics can include everything from an overview of the organization and board structure to Robert's Rules of Order, which a lot of people are not familiar with. They need ongoing training, too, as well as orientation. It's really important to put some time and thought into creating some training that meets ongoing needs. A good way to determine your ongoing training needs is to conduct a board self-evaluation. So, for example, if your board is telling you frequently that they really don't understand your budget and the financial statements that they're asked to review in board meetings, you can create some specific training around that. They also need regular refreshers. Keep important concepts on top of mind with refresher type meetings. Maybe it's simply it's as simple as just having someone from your audit committee to take a few minutes during a regular board meeting to bring the rest of the board up to speed on their role in an upcoming audit. Or as Matt and I know, Accounting pronouncements and guidelines seem to be constantly changing. Matt mentioned a, a major change that's coming through uh, just a little earlier. Uh, so it could be that having the CPA that's serving on your board or your outside CPA to take a minute during a board minute, meeting to explain the new accounting changes that may be coming along. So we'll ask the question then, which of these training best practices do you employ in your organization? Annual new member orientation, ongoing board training, regular updates and refreshers, or an updated board manual. In my experience as a board member on, in various nonprofits, uh, in addition to my, my role in, as a CPA and auditor, I do find that most organizations seem to have some kind of level of orientation, but often not as much ongoing training and updates. So let's uh, give this just a minute more, and we'll see uh, what our answers turn out to be. We're getting pretty close. Go ahead and log your answer, and we'll wrap this one up. OK. So uh, again, in my experience, new, new member orientation is fairly frequently held. In our case here, 46% of our participants said yes. 
ongoing board training is significantly less than that. Um, and then our updates and refreshers and updated board manuals don't take place uh, as often either, so not in the majority of times. So I think we're probably a lot better at handling new board member orientation than we are at ongoing training. And remembering that our ongoing board uh, members need to stay up to speed on what is going on with the organization. Okay. So, in conclusion, the question goes back to what we said at the very beginning. Are your board members all that they can be? Back to that Army recruiting slogan, as nonprofits become more complex and the communities they serve become more diverse every day, it's imperative that board members know their duties, fiduciary and compliance duties, they understand their roles, and they provide the high-level leadership that the organization needs to march full steam ahead. As far as our next steps, uh, we do have some information here you can see. Uh, that notforprofitboardtraining.com uh, is a place where there's a brief survey of your organization and its current board training, as well as an opportunity to request more information if you'd like to have that. Also, we've produced a white paper document entitled Board Member Boot Camp that expands on those concepts that we've all talked about today. And that's available on our firm website at cricpa.com. Also, I have to kind of note here for just a minute to, to check out our site, particularly the non-for-profit board area uh, that we have on, on our website, for articles that have been written by our firm partners across the Southeast on a variety of topics that are important to nonprofit organizations. You'll also find some short videos on some topics such as unrelated business income taxes, 990 questions, and fundraising expenses. We do very much appreciate your participation uh, in our webinar today. If you have any questions, go ahead and type those in. And to go back to remind everybody what we said to start with, uh, you will be getting a, a link later in the day to the recording of the webinar, uh, not the actual slides, but the recording of it. So you'll be you can be on the lookout for that to come along a little bit later on today. With no questions, I think we'll go ahead and wrap things up. But we do very much appreciate your participation. Hope you'll uh, hope you've gotten something from it, and that you'll participate in future webinars that we have for our nonprofit organizations. Thank you very much. <laughs>